Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Uh, a new and emerging uh, field, specialty uh, in the field of psychology, is being uh, spearheaded and, um, well, basically pioneered by our guest in studio today, Miss Dawn Karen, New York-based city professional and, as I say, the pioneering mind behind the global field of fashion psychology. Now, years ago, while pursuing an MA in counseling psychology at Columbia University, she received this inspiration to create a dynamic field of fashion psychology. And she's here with us today to talk about uh, being a fashion psychologist and also about uh, establishing the school uh, of fashion psychology known as the Fashion Psychology Institute. How are you doing, Dawn? Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you so you. much. Um, you are a, a returning guest uh, here to uh, here at Health Professional Radio. It, it's been a while since we uh, talked with you uh, before. At the time, the uh, the brand new field of fashion psychology was uh, emerging thanks to you and, and your efforts in education. Talk about um, your uh, progression to the point where you've opened the Fashion Psychology Institute. Yes. Well, um, you guys were one of my first interviews. And since then, I have interviewed, I have media interviews in about 14 countries. So I've been really trying to establish the field um, in uh, in entertainment, I would like to say, um, just, you know, as far as journalism is concerned. And once I did that, I would have frequently students write me and say, how can I become a fashion psychologist? How can I become a fashion psychologist? Um, seemingly because, you know, it's not like fashion blogging. You can't just, you know, hey, I want to be a fashion blogger and put up a blog. So everyone kept asking me and I'm like, well, you know, I was kind of dancing around like, okay, I'll teach it at some point. And then after I did the journalist, the journalism part, I started to, after getting so many message from pe messages from people in Australia and Jamaica and Germany and Pakistan, um, even in America, I was like, okay, I should make the Fashion Psychology Institute. So I um, have the institute and currently my students are from Australia um, currently that are enrolled right now, but I've accepted some acceptance letters to students in um, Spain, mm -hmm. um, Jamaica, and Hong Kong. So, um, yeah, and right, right now, global. yeah, definitely global. Um, it's, it's the way of the future. And I've also gotten the field to be taught at the Fashion Institute of Technology here in New York City. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so, and it's, I'm, I'm working on um, bringing the, 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 the field, the course to other schools in New York City to be taught as a class. So um, wish me luck on that. But yeah, so I, I just basically establishing it as far as academia. Um, in the midst of doing the media interviews, um, I was approached by several, um, uh, like to do TV shows, several big media wigs to do TV shows. But I, it was something really important for me to establish it, you know, education wise before we jumped jumped into the deep end of you know, entertainment, reality TV, and whatnot, so... No, you know, many of our listeners, well, a, a good uh, good many of them are health professionals in, in some uh, form or another. And when yeah. we hear the word psychology, uh, uh, I guess uh, not a normal uh, stereotype comes to mind, but I guess the stereotype that is the norm of the psychologist, um, you know, helping those uh, with mental problems, uh, maybe yeah. a child psychologist or a criminal psychologist. Uh, when yeah. it comes to fashion psychology, tell our listeners what, what we're talking about. We're not talking about um, someone having a problem with fashion to the point where they need to um, seek mental health. Right. No, no, um, no, no, yeah. not at all. Um, right. we're, we're, with the definition, how I define it is, the study of how color, image, style, and fashion affect human behavior while addressing cultural norms and cultural sensitivities. So um, this could be used um, for a number of things um, to help or help alleviate eating disorders. Mm -hmm. um, I've done it where a client has approached me and they want to reach a higher uh, tax bracket. Um, and so how do we get there? So we don't um, give makeovers um like you see on tv and and you know berate you and say hey you're you know you look a mess no we don't do that because that's actually the opposite that's actually damaging to the psyche which we found in this field so 
what we do is um, seemingly count, go through the traditional therapy of doing talk therapy and drawing correlations to an insight to how what the person experienced either in their past or currently affects how they present themselves to the world. And that can be dress, body language, speech. So we style from the inside out, the internal to the external. When, um, when you're styling someone, as you say, from the inside out, uh, mm-hmm. how much of this is self-talk uh, that you coach the person through, I guess for lack of a better term, um, how much of it is positive self-esteem um, that is related you know, to your appearance, not necessarily your clothing? Yes, and this is um, what, what you see on TV is the opposite with the makeovers. They start with the clothing, and then they put the clothing on you, and voila, you're supposed to be healed. You're supposed to be cured of any uh, self-esteem issues. No, we really work on building the self-esteem or working through getting to the root of whatever issue. I don't know, it could be a relationship issue. Um, I've had a, a client who was sexually assaulted, and um, she wore baggy clothes you know, because of that. So just working through that. And like I said, I don't prescribe any medicine or anything like that, but just actually getting to the root of it. Um, again, um, I'm trained to be a counselor. So, you know, it's, it's a, again, it's a new field. So um, it's, it's great. Uh, it's a great field and it's a great um, new discipline to the psychology, subfield to the psychology discipline. You know, um, when you're talking about subfields, uh, mm-hmm. you know, most uh, occupations have, you know, different divisions, different levels, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, you've got students. You yes. have your own, um, your own reasoning, your own um, philosophies on fashion, on style, on how they relate to a person's psyche, and how they present themselves to the world. Thereby, getting that positive feedback from the yes. world. Yes. How does a student develop their own theory? How do you guide a student? to develop their own theory and not necessarily follow your guide. Um, I'm sure you don't want a cookie cutter uh, group of <laughs> professionals out there in your, your, uh, your field. Yeah. Well, um, what we're, what I'm just, um, cause I'm currently the students are in Australia. So mm-hmm. I actually have them to create their own, um, you know, philosophy because everyone brings their own, you know, subjectivity mm-hmm. to anything that they do. Mm-hmm. So what we're working on, um, they do have to do some sort of thesis, but relating it to um, their friends, like people um, that personally can affect them. Um, uh, for instance, I had a student, um, she has a brother who seeks validation um, for, seeks validation on Instagram, you know, and how that could affect his psyche down the line and how he presents himself to the world. So um, developing um, a theory, her own theory around something that could personally affect her. So um, I'm not really looking for, um, I'm looking for something that is, uh, that is a part of the, the student's value system, if that makes any sense. Does, um, or I guess my question should be, how much does uh, fashion play a role in, um, I guess, turning someone one around in a career change? Um, not necessarily uh, climbing up the career ladder, but say you, you want to get out of uh, you want to get out of the medical profession, and yes. um, there was a you know it's always it's suit and tie, it's uh, mm-hmm. it's very uh, formal, very suspenders, you know that sort of thing, mm-hmm. and uh, you decide to get out of that and you want to change, you want to go into something totally different, but you've got that suit and tie for lack of a better term mentality, and you mm-hmm. want to get rid of that. Does fashion psychology address such a drastic change as that? Yes, and we don't make it so drastic where you're, um, as if you're, you know, in this uh, suit and tie, and then okay, maybe you're in, I don't know, um, athletic gear because you want to be um, an athletic trainer. Um, we don't do it. We're not into shocking the system, um, or shocking the psyche. You know, where what we're into is is a slow, gradual process to help you work through that change. So, um, you wearing that suit and tie could um, elicit certain uh, body language, how you carry yourself. Um, What does it mean to you when you're not in the suit and tie? How do you feel? Does your body language change? Does your speech change? So we seemingly work through those things before you get to, okay, I'm going to wear my athletic gear because now I want to be an athletic trainer. 
So it's a, it's a, it's not a drastic shock to the system like you see on TV with the makeovers. We really work on the psyche, then we move to the external, which is the cloak. Um, as we wrap up this this segment, how much, especially now with um, the political, uh, for lack of for the political season at <laughs> boiling point right now, how much does a fashion psychologist pay to the political world when it comes to what people are wearing? Uh, what people are wearing to certain functions as uh, supporters or what they're wearing as candidates, uh, how much um, fashion psychology plays a part there? Well, yeah. Um, if you even look at Donald Trump, for example, um, and um, well, I don't want to say anything bad because there may be some Trump supporters that are listening, um, but um, it's it's all in, you know, he gives his little speeches. Sometimes he trails off, but what does he wear while he's saying those speeches? What colors does he wear? Um, and how that could affect um, you receiving the speech. If you're, if you're listening to it versus watching it on TV and you're seeing images of Trump and what he's wearing, that could play a role on if you're receptive or not to his speech and his ideals, what he's saying. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a lot more uh, uh, intricate than what we see as just a guy in a red tie, right? Yes, very. Um, I think what you're alluding to is a little bit of color psychology, but it's much more intricate when we just add the overall fashion fashion theme. You've yeah. been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. We've been in studio talking with Don Karen, New York-based professional and the pioneering mind behind the global field, a truly go global field of fashion psychology. Uh, she's been uh, traveling the world since last we spoke, and she was here, uh, uh, well, maybe a year or more ago here uh, on uh, Health Professional Radio, uh, Malaysia, Kuwait, Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi, and, and so many other places promoting this brand new field of fashion psychology. She's um, also opened the Fashion Psychology Institute where uh, her theories are being um, being passed on to others who can uh, you know go ahead and further this field that uh, Don has uh, so lovingly pioneered to all of us. It's been great having you here with us today, Don. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm. And you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes.